recognize this. I just walk over here, maybe I, I'm just I did gonna... say hello and good morning, and I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm with you. All right, good morning. good morning. If I just keep saying it, more people will walk in and start looking at me, or at least the Lord. So what would you prefer I do, just talk about stuff over your talking, or would you like me to, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I could just start singing, that would get everybody to stop. Who said that? Welcome to the family gathering today. I love spending time with the Lord with you. Thank you, Lord. My heart has been postured toward Him in such a, like, I'm not even sure what the word is, but it's just been so open to Him all morning. And I'm I'm impressed again by how willing he is to be communicating with us. And even right now, I just, I'm experiencing this rush of life toward me and from me. And I pray that this morning you'll experience that too. And so, Lord, we just posture our heart toward you. Turn our hearts, Lord God, from affections of this life. Things that want to pull our attention away from the source of life you are. Would you do that with me? Just turn your heart. You have the authority over your own heart, so turn it intentionally as if you're turning away from something and you're turning toward the Lord My heart is toward you is toward you. I don't want to just sing a song today. I want my heart to be in His and His heart in mine so that it becomes so much more than music and song. It becomes encounter. It becomes oneness between He and I. He and all of us together. Wouldn't it be great if our individual unity turned into a corporate oneness that brought forth an incredible explosion of life corporately? Oh Lord, we long for that together. That the bride might be one, even among the other churches in our area, Lord God, that are right now turning their hearts towards you too. We think about our brothers and sisters in other buildings and other congregations gathering under the same desire to connect, to hear, to experience you. Join us together, O oh God, as one. What a many-membered, beautiful bride you have, Jesus. And thank you that you're so intimate with each and every one of us. 
So we rejoice in the fact that we are one with you. One with the King of all kings. One with the Creator. We are one with you. We honor you, Holy Spirit. If you're not holding a child, could you just lift up your arms to the Lord and honor the Holy Spirit? We give our allegiance anew and afresh to you, Holy Spirit. Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of the Father, we give you newfound glory and honor today. We welcome you among us today. We choose to see one another like you see. We choose to see the Lord and think His thoughts like you do. Holy Spirit, we honor you. Holy Spirit, of our singing we will not forget you in the midst of our searching we will not forget you we honor you oh God we honor you Spirit, Holy Spirit, we are, we are,
Oh, guys, don't just stay there, please. Guys, 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 listen. Whoo, I want to tell you, guys, just. He is, look, okay, so we know like the tempter offered Eve fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Okay, we know that story. Listen, right now, Jesus is offering you the most succulent fruit you will ever, ever experience from the tree of life. Right now, right now, right now, okay? That story's history, right? Okay? The temptation's still there. But I want to tell you, right now, Jesus is offering you Himself as the most succulent fruit that you will ever experience. I mean, I'm talking rich, juicy goodness that is just for you He's offering it to you, and all you got to do is take a bite. Jesus says, will you take a bite of me? Will you eat me? Will you partake of me? What are you doing messing around with that stuff over there? Come on over here and eat from the tree of life. Listen, he is the tree of life. Guys, come on. Yeah, delightful. Talk about delightful. Right? So... It's for you. It's for me. Take a bite of Jesus. Come on.
alone. It's a song about God being the author and the finisher of everything that he starts.
to PA What he did for me What he did for me I remember a day when I came to the who When I had an array of brothers and sisters covering me Through a divorce, separation, didn't think I'd make it through Depression, suicide, thoughts You spoke to me the other week About a mom spirit Didn't seem like nothing was gonna come through I have a young 21 year old out there in the world who's lost, seems lost, but a praying mama, cause you encourage me, you encourage me. This is not for show, because I know deep down in my soul what he did for me, didn't think I'm gonna make it through. Before we get off of this, I want you to take, stay right here guys, I want you to take every situation that you cannot change right now with all your power and put it in your hand like this. If you have two hands, like I can't, because I'm holding a microphone, but if you could have two hands, every situation you cannot change in your own power, even your own mistakes that led to the current situation you're in, other people's decisions, choices, whatever, put them right there. Sing over them. Faithful. 
forever you will be Jesus faithful you are all your promises all your promises are yes and amen no. now take your eyes off of your hand and put them up to the Lord but keep your hand up and sing faithful you are keep your eyes up keep your hand out faithful forever you will be come on faithful you are and all your promises are yes and amen come on worship team go all your keep your eyes up come on keep your eyes up faithful faithful you are up this is the posture we'll take with you father we're going to take our eyes off of what we cannot fix and what we cannot change and we're going to keep our eyes on the one who said all things are possible so we trust you with the Daniels as Kim just said the Daniels in our lives we trust you with all of them every single one of them we've done all we can so now we put our trust in you who is faithful who is faithful come on let your own soul hear your words I trust you father I trust you father one day we're going to be able to do this and we're going to throw it up in the air like confetti. And it's going to rain down glory all around us.
this house Tuesday evening at one o'clock in the morning I was awakened and the Lord started giving me a lesson on a volcano now just bear with me I'm going somewhere with this and he shared with me what happens is when a volcano before and during and after and before a volcano erupts there's a lot of things that are going on underground that nobody knows nobody can see nobody can sense but the scientists they have this mechanism that they can pick up these sounds and there's many people in this house you've been feeling something inside and you can't just you can't put your finger on it right now but it's like something's brewing inside I can feel it inside and I can also feel it outside and then when the, the, the before that there's what they call belching where a volcano will actually belch and it will belch up ashes and this is just a moment leading to the eruption. And then when the actual eruption takes place, the atmosphere is changed. The ecosystem is changed. The animal life, the plant life, it's all changed. The atmosphere and the environment, everything's changed. And that's what's taking place in this place. Something is about to erupt. 
and it's going to bring change. And the authorities, they say when this eruption takes place, run from it, run from it. But the scientists, they run to it because they're intrigued by it. They want to know more about it. And see, the religious leaders will say, when the eruption takes place, run from it, run from it. Don't have anything to do with it. But God is going to be stirring people's hearts and lives. And they're going to run to this place because they want to see what's happening. And I want to tell you something. There's some prodigals who have left this family and they're going to be coming back. God is already wooing them. He's already speaking to their hearts and their spirits. And when these men and women and boys and girls come back, we can't be like the older son. We have to be like the father and accept them with open arms. We have to throw the robe on them. We have to give them the signet ring. And we have to kill the fatted calf because they're coming back, people. They're coming back. They're coming back to this place because this is where they belong. This is where their destiny lies. And I got one more thing here. Just hold on. One more thing. The little girl last week who said, stood up here and she said, I want to hug people. I want to encourage people. Is she here today? You know what? Can you stand right there? Is her mom and dad here? Could you turn this way? But I need you to put it over your eyes first. Put your hand. Father, I ask that you will release the prophetic eyesight that is in this child. And I pray that she will see what the treasure is in each and every heart. Now will you put it on your mouth? And that she will speak forth those prophetic words. That she will draw out the treasure that is in the wells of those hearts. That she will be an encouragement. That she will hug everybody and tell everybody they're special. Mm. Now put your hand on your head. Father, I pray for dreams. I pray for visions. I pray for angelic encounters will come upon her, Lord. I pray, oh God, that she will be that voice that's crying out in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And I encourage mom and dad, Lord, I, I know you guys are already doing this, but I'm encouraging you even more to let her do this. Let her prophesy to her stuffed animals. Let her prophesy to her doll babies. And when she starts saying some really weird things that you can't really comprehend and wrap your mind around it, encourage it. Encourage it. And just feed upon that. Now I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. And I don't let too many people do this. But will you touch my head? And will you say to me, I release childlike faith into you. I release childlike faith into you. Thank you.
like you're in a trench or a ditch, the only reason you're in there is because you dug it. You can get out. If you can't get out yourself, ask him. He'll pull you out. He didn't put you in there. He doesn't want you in there. So come out of the ditch. Come out of the trench. Stand on higher ground. Because the Lord wants you there. Father, we're just so thankful for the privilege of worshiping you, for the privilege of knowing you, for the privilege of being, of realizing we are continually loved by you. Father, we can't thank you enough. We couldn't thank you enough. You have given us everything of yourself. You don't hold anything back, Father. And may we return our love. May we return our faith and our devotion to you. Even now, Father, as we prepare to give our offering, Father, we want to do it with a cheerful heart. We want to do it with a expectant heart, a confident heart in your faithfulness, Lord. You're faithful to keep what we commit to you. So as you have your offering, if you're giving an offering, just want you to give it with the same spirit that we uh, held our hands out before the Lord and looked up to heaven. Let's give with that spirit, with that heart. Okay? There we go. Come on. Give and it'll be given to you. Good measure. Press down. Shake it together. Running over. Thank you, Father.
Hello. Hey, can we just all stand up and give the worship team a round of applause, please? Thank you, guys. And girls, you already left the stage. But thank you for what you give to us every week. We really appreciate it. Even you, Chris. We appreciate you, too. Okay, uh, is it full kids church today? All right. So if you are first grade and up, you go to the my right, which is your left. If you're kindergarten and below, you go that way. Am I right on that? Yeah. All right. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Look at that right there. My favorite graphic. Thank you. All right, good morning again. Good morning. Really glad you all are here. Uh, this month we're focusing on uh, children and marriage and the family and all that fun stuff. Last week I talked on like before, like when you're married but before the kids come, which is like the greatest time of life. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then the kids come and just create a new kind of great. Uh, so we talked about that. I, gave, I, I think I gave some pretty important things for you guys to be thinking about. So um, that is on our YouTube channel as well as our podcast. I might refer back to a couple of those things today. But today I'm going to talk about marriage and teenagers. Lord God. So marriage and adolescence today. Okay. So how many people have adolescence in their home? How many people were adolescents at one time? There we go. All right, now we got the rest of the hands up. Okay, so you're either going to learn how to handle the ones in your house or you're going to finally realize why you were the way you were today. Um, at some point in time, every single one of us will either have been one, will be one, or will have to parent one. I even have people in this room that are teachers of young people, right? We've got some teachers of young people here. We've got youth leaders of young people in here. We have friends of young people, mentors. And I have found some really important uh, strategies just being a dad of my four children. I now have a 22, 20, 18, and 14-year-old. I don't know how that happened. And I, I, I don't. I don't know how they're still alive, to be real. But we made it, kind of. We're still there. And none of them are in the room right now, right? No. Oh, crap. All right. There's one. Okay. <laughs> I was just, I was gonna, now I can't say anything I want. But. So I, I'm not going to go in the order I gave them to you. Is that unfair to you or is that fair? Hence the message today. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's it right there. There we go. So now here's the prayer at the end. Titus chapter 2, verse 6. Look at that. Huh? Likewise, urge the young men. And I know that, you know, in the Bible, for whatever reason, a lot of times they refer to just the men here. But I have decided, based on the Father's heart, that we're going to change that word to people. Okay? Likewise, urge the young people to be sensible, please. Travis, quit interrupting them. I'm asking them to be sensible. Okay. Likewise, urge them to be sensible in all things, 
Show yourself to be an example of good deeds. That means that youth and young children, and just so you get an idea, the term adolescent actually means from about 12, 13 years old up to adulthood. That's kind of like the understood kind of like period of time called adolescence. And even then, they are to be examples of good deeds. They're not just supposed to be learning. They're not just supposed to be ones that are looking up to someone. They're supposed to be exemplifying what it looks like to be good. With purity in do wow. In doctrine, dig does that, what does it says here? dignified, that should be a dignified. With purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech. Like, I'm just going to ask an honest question. How many of our young people know doctrine? Hello? In fact, I'm willing to bet that a lot of us would probably think, including my own child, ah, doctrine. I want to tell you, doctrine is really important. Why we believe what we believe matters. To just walk around saying, well, this is what I believe. Someone will challenge our young people. And they will ask them why. And if all they have is, well, my dad said so. Or I'll give you my dad's phone number. Or because this is what I believe. That's not enough. I think we have a responsibility that our children, young people, know why they believe what they believe. I think theology and doctrine is important. I think it's important because what we believe about God and about ourselves is how we live. So I encourage you, doctrine, living dignified, living with sound speech, which is beyond reproach. In other words, our young people's words should be without the ability to negatively judge them. So that the opponent will be put to shame. Now that, that can mean a lot of things. That could be someone who doesn't believe and is kind of trying to, trying to oppose them. Or it could be the devil or somewhere in between. Having nothing bad to say about us. Uh, next one's 1 John chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Wow, I love it. You're the woman. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I love that. We're not supposed to get old and mature and then finally overcome the evil one. Our young people, at their age, in their 13s, 14s, and 15s, should be overcoming the one who wants to destroy them. They're not too young to have that. In fact, the Bible talks about that one of the greatest things about youth is strength. All the old people said, Amen. Amen. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. That was one of the verses I didn't get to last week. That actually means little children. The little children know the Father. It's one of the things I wish I could have said. Is if we just hang around kids, I think I might have mentioned this last week. Hang around young children, you will get to know the heart of the Father. It's so true. The wonder and excitement is all a reflection of the heart of the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. He says this again. That's a repeat. So that's important. Fathers, you should be continuing in your knowing of the Lord. And I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Both times he repeats himself. This time he adds strong and the word of God abides in you. Now I know most of the time because we've grown up in the church, we see the word of God and that often means what to us? The Bible. You know that John didn't have one. So what's he referring to? He's got to be referring to Jesus. Jesus refers to Je I'm sorry, the Bible refers to Jesus as the word of God. So I believe John is speaking of Jesus here. You have Jesus in you, young people. And you have this strength and vitality of life. And you will overcome the evil one. Amen? Amen? Amen. So let me give you some Old Testament stuff too. I'm going to throw a bunch of verses at you and then you're going to get my opinions, which I think are right. <clears throat> but <laughs> Proverbs 20, 29 also confirms that the glory of young men is their 
strength. And the honor old men is their gray hair. I mean, really? Come on. Is this all we get? <laughs> this is all we get? <sighs> the glory of young men is their strength. I love that. Go to Isaiah 40. I'm going to throw all these verses out there right away. Though Everybody knows this verse. My mom gave this verse to me on an index card right before I went to college for my first day. She gave it to me and I drove off to college and I hung this in my desk, right above my desk. Though youths grow tired and weary and vigorous young men stumble badly. I like that particular translation because guess what? Young men stumble badly. Can I hear a young man's amen? amen. All right, very good. Yet those who wait for the Lord, that's not just wait like... <clears throat> That weight means to attend to. That means to be focused upon the Lord. Will gain new strength. And they will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk or not get tired. And they will walk and not be weary. This is an important verse because even though use like glory is their strength, it does run out. And we of the next generation, us parents, us mentors and fathers and mothers among them and in their lives can remind them that there is life and there is more. Get up again. Turn your heart toward the Lord. I want to tell you, our young people, more than any other generation, our adolescents, have so many other influences shouting at them for attention. I mean, right now in 2018, I thought it was bad when I was growing up in the 70s and 80s. But man, now, I, I didn't have technology coming at me in my room, in my hand, in the privacy of my own. I had to be out into the living room where I had to get the newspaper or turn on the radio. And even then, my parents could hear it. Come on. Now the children have this, and no one has to know about it. I actually think it's too private. It's very disconcerting to me as a parent. So knowing and having an awareness of what's going on in our children's lives is so important. And as that takes place, because what's going on is those influences, and there was this verse, I shared it several months ago from Hosea, talking about the winds of, are, are, are in our lives to try to steer us off course. And I feel like children's, the influences in the world are trying to steer them off course, and really the goal is to steal life from them to steal their strength, to make them of no effect so when the opponent does come, it takes over. But those who wait for the Lord gain new strength and they will mount up with wings like eagles and they run and not get tired, walk and not be faint. I love this verse from Joel 2. It's actually repeated in Acts 2. And I love this. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Right before that, it says that the Lord will pour out His Spirit on all flesh, right? That's what it says right before that. And then the next words are your sons and daughters. This is speaking to moms and dads, saying, listen to your children. I think we have a tendency to believe, especially as they become young adults, because they're not listening to us anymore. Hello? Any parents of teenagers in the room? There's all of a sudden, it's like, uh, suddenly these people that they worshipped now don't know anything. It's an amazing switch that takes place in a matter of years. Where we were everything to them just a couple of years ago. And now all we are to them is an ATM. Here's the thing. When they stop listening, we will almost turn a deaf ear to them too. And here's what the Lord is saying to us. He says, don't stop listening. Even when they do. Because they're prophesying. This is a really important concept I saw here. I never saw it this way before until I read this verse this way. I suddenly realized that the Lord is telling us parents, teachers, mentors, listen, because in the hearts of our young people is the voice of the Lord. They're going to see visions. I love this. In other words, their imagination is still alive. Us adults... Reality has beat our imagination into submission. But that word vision isn't just the Lord giving them visions. It actually means their ability to see in their heart. Is their eyes are still open. 
they can still see and imagine a future with hope. Where us adults, because of our disappointments and failures and things that have happened to us, our eyes grow dim. Someone say amen. I just want to make sure I'm in the right room. Yeah. But the wonder of young people in our lives is they keep our eyes up and open. Yeah? All right. So I'm going to, just because I have a lot to say here, and uh, this is based on both experience and some more scripture that I'm going to bring to you. I'm going to give you some principles I've learned by not only being a teenager, but by parenting them. What I learned. And these are in no particular order. These are just all important. Okay? First of all, I think we ought to create an environment for our children that is stable. I don't think there ought to be a lot of change. Parents, I'm talking to you specifically. You should not instigate or create a lot of change when you have children in adolescence. Because, do I have a teenager in the room right now? Levi, come here. Yeah, come here. Your mom pointed at you, so you can blame her later for this. <laughs> Stand right here. Everybody take a look at him. Doesn't he look nice and calm and cool? I mean, gosh, you got a fedora on. How not cool is that? That is so cool, okay? And he looks so calm, even though he's like, like, I really don't want to be standing up here next to this guy right now. He looks so calm, cool, and collected. There is so much change going on inside of that body right now. Like an abundance of change. Us 40, 50, and older don't have near as much change going inside of here as is going inside of there. This is a volcanic eruption of not only physical change, but emotional change. Thoughts are swirling around inside of this head. Us older people can barely garner up enough energy to have a thought. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy to think now. These guys can't help it. They're thinking all the time, and their emotions are mixed up with that. And now they've got hormones. Come on, someone say hormones. They're all rising up, and they're all, they're all rolling around inside of this. There is so much change happening here, even though he looks like, I got my cut stuff together. I'm good. I got a fedora on. This is all just like, I'm good. But inside, it's like, I'm not good. All right, have a seat. I'm sorry. The point is this, they look like they're good. They look like they've got it all together. But there is so much happening inside of them. And if on the outside of them is tumult and chaos and lots of change, it creates an unfortunate like storm in the harbor. They're, they have to anchor themselves somewhere. And us parents, us mentors, us teachers, we are that anchor for them. While the storm's going on inside, we don't want to create another one outside. So I want to encourage you. Actually, I, I just want to speak in general, not, not even about kids or parents or anything. I think if you have a lot of change happening in your life, you're probably immature. Just before you're like, just hold on a second. If you're, on, if you're constantly like making a change, this has got to be a change, this has got to be a change, this has got to be a change, then you're four, how old? 14, right? Yeah, yeah. Then you're 14 old fedora carrying dude, trying to act like you got it all together, but it's all this change is going on. You're immature. As we grow and mature, we're supposed to know who we are to the point where if we make a decision, it's a decision that's going to last a while. Do you hear my heart on this? If there's constant ongoing change, you probably don't know who you are and what you're really supposed to be doing in the earth. So, parents, get a grip on your identity as a son or daughter of the Father. Get an understanding of who the Father is in you and His heart for you and begin to establish a stable environment around you so that those who are going through incredible change inside of them have a safe place to grow. Okay? We all right? Second one. Parents should be united. Amen. I got one amen. And I don't even, 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Parents should be united. I think parents right now, if you're 12 or 13 year old and you've got kids up into the early 20s, you should be talking more than you've ever talked before. You should be and you need to because there is stuff going on in your house that has never happened there before. There should be a lot of talking, both in front of the kids and privately. Our kids need to see us continuing to relate to each other. We should not only be having our conversations and, dare I say, conflicts behind closed doors. Now, I'm telling you, this is my opinion, okay? I think we need to teach our children in front of them how to properly handle conflict. I know I grew up with parents who rarely fought in front of my, my siblings. Now, I had no example. Even if it was wrong, at least I could see it. But I had no example. And I'm not saying all fighting in front of children is good. Okay, please do not hear my heart on this. Don't hear me say something I'm not saying. But if we actually took our relationship with our wife and husband seriously and we encountered one another in front of our children, number one, you, you carry yourself a little differently when you know you have an audience. Especially a learning audience. So now the standard raises just because you have eyes watching Secondly, there, and it's not just in conflict, it's an actual conversation. It's actual relationship. Like, my children have seen me be affectionate toward my wife. Am I right? I'm just making sure. Yeah. I have kissed her in front of them. I have held her in front of them. I have danced with her in the kitchen in front of them. And I can't dance, so you've got to know that's a big step for me. And my whole family can dance except me. I guess it came from Dawn. It's really frustrating. But I, I want to do this in front of them. So our communicate, and here's, the, here's another fun thing. We communicate about our children in front of our children. We don't talk behind their backs. Why teach them that now when they're at home? Teach them how to talk behind people's backs? I don't like it. So we have the same conversations with them about them with each other as we do behind closed doors. Again, it keeps the standard up. I can't just say whatever I want to say about my kids. Hello? Yeah. And don't get me wrong. Dawn and I do have conversations behind closed doors, but we then have them with our children too. So talk a lot, husband and wife, mom and dad. It's so important. Always get the full picture from each other before addressing anything with the kids. This is what I have found out. My relationship with my kids is different than Dawn's relationship with her kids. She has different interactions with my girls than I do. I have different interactions with Anderson than she does. And we have to communicate so I can find out what's going on. I can't get the full picture. So Dawn and I have to communicate a lot about, hey, how'd it go with Maddie today? Or what'd you talk about with Megan today? Or let me tell you what I did with Anderson today. And that, that gives Dawn the full picture and me the full picture of what's happening when we're not there. There's, and especially when it comes to discipline, which last week, by the way, I mentioned discipline is not about behavior. Anybody remember what I said discipline was about? Identity, the spirit of who they really are. <clears throat> I said this last week, and I think it bears repeating. I do not desire my children to behave right. I don't. I desire my children to be fully alive. Fully alive people act right. If they know who they are, that's why my discipline is always focused on who they are. I spend time talking to the Lord about my children. I spend time talking to Dawn about my children. And then I spend time talking to my children about my children. And the whole point is I get to know them. And then when I see them acting outside of their identity, I don't correct behavior. Because everybody corrects behavior outside of the home. They have rules and laws in school and on the highway and in everything. And it's all just so people don't kill each other. But that doesn't create a better society. What creates a better society is when people's hearts are fully open and alive. They love accurately. They don't just act right. So our discipline in our home, if we could discipline ourselves as parents now to look at our children and base our discipline on like my, I'll just give an example of this. So if two of my children might be interacting intensely, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it rarely happens in my house. But if it would happen in our house, 
we would not just tell them to knock it off, flick their mouths, and go to separate rooms until they calm down. You can ask Maddie. That's not how we do it. We talk about how are you thinking and feeling about your sister or brother? How does it make them feel when they hear their sister, who's supposed to love them more than just about anybody else on the planet, talks that way to them? This is not who you were created to be. This is your brother. This is your sister. These are your sisters. How does a sister love another sister? How do they speak to one another? If you talk in terms of standards, not in terms of rules. Rules are already about, always about what you don't do. Standards are always about what we're going after, what we're, what we're uh, aspiring to. Standards, you can inspire people to walk by standards. Rules, you have to punish them into reality. Do you hear the difference? So I would rather continually bring up the standard, remind our family, these are the standards of our home, than don't do this, don't do that. And if you do what I told you don't, then you're going to get your cell phone taken away for a week. I do not want my children not doing things because they want their cell phone back. Hello? I want people doing things because it's right within them to do it. Hello? Like, I'll be honest with you, the reason why I do not drive 85, 90 miles an hour on the road is because I don't want a ticket. And I like my license. I should be thinking more about the safety of the people around me. But the main reason why I drive the speed limit or thereabouts, <laughs> thereabouts. is honestly because of the penalty. And there's something better than not being penalized. Human beings were meant to live at a higher standard than not being penalized. We were set free from the law. And if we're to be good parents, we need to give them something better than law. They will want to rebel. Paul says it in Romans 7. As, as soon as I realized that the law told me not to covet, all kinds of covetousness right up inside of me. That's exactly what happens when we tell our kids, do not take any cookies from the cookie jar. Boy, it's amazing how many cookies aren't there the next day. You can't help it. All right, I'm moving on. I've given enough examples of that. Okay, so parents talk a lot in front of the kids and in private, right? Good. Number three, make your home the hangout place. Now, I'll be honest with you, I think Dawn and I could have done a better job of this. I mean, we had lots of hangouts and lots of people at our house but I wish we would have had our friends of our children over more. If you're being intentional as a parent of adolescents, but you can see through that. Trust your instincts with your children's friends. I really mean that. Parents, trust your instincts. I, I highly suggest making your home the hangout, okay? All right, here's more. Oh, this is a fun one. I think all the adolescents in the room probably ought to cover their ears with this one. Do not rush as parents, boyfriends and girlfriends. Do not rush it. I can't tell you how many parents I've been around, and they're like 9, 10, 11, maybe even 12 or 13 years old, and they're all, the ongoing question parents ask are, so, any cute boys or girls? What we're doing is we're creating this importance of romance at an age where they can't process it yet. Parents, I'm not saying discourage it. I'm not saying don't do it because it's just going to be a rule that they can't wait to break and now they're going to have all these private relationships. Don't do that either. But for the most part, if you're building an intentional relationship with your children, what you focus on in their lives, they will. So if one of the regular topics of conversation are, so who's going out with who in your class? Or, hey, anybody you might be interested in? Or... Hey, what boys like you or girls like you, I promise you, they will start to put value on that when their psyche and their emotional state cannot handle it. I used to ask my children this all the time, and they actually started to hate this question. What part of your life at 14 would be better with a boyfriend? It's an honest question. I wasn't thinking, I wasn't going to, I honestly wanted to know from them. Tell me, schoolwork, would that be better or worse with a boyfriend? Unless, of course, he's the valedictorian, then bring him over. <laughs> uh, sports, 
No, most girls do sports with girls, and boys do sports with boys, so that wasn't going to work. Um, relationships with your friends? No, most of the time the boyfriend would take your time from your relationships with good, healthy friends. Come on. Relationship with your parents? Come on. Unless the guy or girl is more interested in you than the girl or boy, which is never the case, I've never had a boy come over and want to hang out with me. How y'all doing? You well? Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Philip will come over and hang out with me. I like that. I would encourage instead strong friendships where truest identity can be discovered. Every one of us who have ever dated before knows this. When you date, you don't know who they really are. Hang out with them as friends. Now, I'm not saying not date. I am not the Joshua Harris from the 90s where you can't date. I kissed, dating, goodbye, all that stuff. That was just another law that led to a whole lot of really bad stuff in the church. Just encourage what I think is healthy at that particular age and time. I am telling you, if you really want to know, and I'll speak to, if there's any teenagers in the room, I'll tell you this. You really don't know a person by dating them. You think you do. You don't. You really know a person in friendship because there's no I have to put an air on and be what I think the other person wants in a friendship. In friendship, people are usually themselves unless they have other issues going on. How are we doing? You guys okay? All right. You guys are trying to decide if I should be talking more about the Lord here or something to make you more excited. I don't know. Okay, here's one. This ought to get your ears perked up. Have sex talks early and often. Yeah? Okay, that's a good question. What's early? Uh, it's too early for you. <laughs> I don't know what anybody else just said other than what Amanda said. That's funny. Okay. I, I, you know, to give you an age would kind of mean like I'm putting this blanket statement over all our children. And there are certain children that are just more mature than others. Okay. But my time frame is usually in the 9 to 12 area where I start the conversations. But here's the thing. We kind of started it way before then. Like the word sex was not a bad word in our home, ever. I, I'll tell you this story. Some of us have heard this story before, but I love this story. So Dawn and I owned a downtown property in uh, Chambersburg. It used to be the, where the uh, armed forces recruiters' offices were. Do you guys remember that when they were, they were still downtown? On North Main Street, there's a few people that might remember that. So we owned that building for a couple of years, and part of the deal was that the landlord had to clean the built the offices for the armed forces. So we were in there, and it was usually one night a week we were in there cleaning all the offices. And Lauren was in there, and we had all three of our girls. We had Lauren, Maddie, and Megan was just born. And one day, near the end of our cleaning, Lauren looks at Mom and says, "Mom, I know you and Daddy sexed three times." Okay. Well, how do you know that? Because you have three girl girls. So, uh, but again, she was, uh, what I love, that's, I love that story, but I also love the fact that she said sexed. Like, I think that's awesome. Way before there was sexting, there was sexed. Like the really good, pure, innocent kind of sexed. Amen. I love that. And as a result, we were having a great conversation with her about that. And she was what? Maybe, Maddie, uh, maybe five? Five-ish? Yeah. So I love that. So we did. We had like, like we didn't tell them about storks or um, mommy ate a baby seed and one day I popped a baby. You know, things like that. We didn't talk about that stuff. We actually had conversations around it. Like we didn't say like mom and dad are now going to, you know, we didn't do that kind of stuff. But when it came to 9, 10, 11, and it was different with each age, we had a very direct, very explicit conversation with each one of them. In fact, and I, I think we got better with it as the children came. Anybody else, like the first time you're just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to do this. So I remember my conversation with Lauren kind of came out of things she was hearing in school, which is frustrating to me. I, 
I get a little frustrated with my children hearing about it before I had the chance to tell them. That's why if you think your children are at an age where they can handle it and not do crazy stuff with it, then I think it's good. And the sooner, the better. So that's why I'm saying even as early as nine. But So we ended up having a really good conversation. But I had to kind of straighten out some things that she had then heard that were different than what she had heard so far from mom and dad. Make the subject of sex normal. I mean this. If you make it taboo, it will be taboo. And then, you know, back to Levi standing here with all that stuff going on, on the inside of him, he's feeling all of these things, but it's taboo to feel them. That's wrong. We should never want our children, what's going on inside of them, to have it feel like it's wrong or it's bad. Sexual desire is beautiful. Everybody should be saying amen in this room. It is beautiful. If there's one thing I never want taken away from me, ever. Ever, 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 ever. So why would we think to tell our kids it's bad? As soon, and I promise you, it's back to one of the earlier things. If you tell them it's bad, they're going to want to do it all the more. And they're going to want to take it out of its context. So tell them about it being holy. Tell them about it being beautiful and give it to the Lord. And I know, I think it was last year or the year before, I spent like three or four weeks talking about sex on a Sunday morning. Didn't we do that? How long ago was that? A couple years ago, maybe. And, you know, one of the things that's really important is that there's a reason why sex is for marriage, not just because it's a rule. It was the sexual union, physical sexual union was meant to solidify the connection between man and woman. Once the physical act of consummation has taken place, after time spent emotionally connecting to each other, after time spent opening our hearts and spiritually connecting to one another, the bodily connection cements two human beings in place together, so much so that to separate them actually takes part of this person here and takes part of this person here. And now they're walking around with broken versions of another person. And every single person in this room that's had premarital sex can tell you, they'll be honest, if they're honest with you, and tell you they still feel this affinity and this connection with those that they've had intercourse with prior to their spouse. It's because God ordained it that way. So why would you ever have that level of connection to someone that you are not committed to for life? He meant it for marriage so that it would hold the two together when times got tough. So make the subject of sex normal, not taboo. If it's presented as a bad thing or as a secret, it will be lusted after instead of regarded as holy. If it's bad and you tell them, don't do that, don't do that, don't touch yourself, don't, don't go look at another girl bad and all this kind of stuff, I promise you, you will bring up all the seeds of lust on the inside of them. And then secretly in their bedrooms, they'll long for the thing that you said was bad. But if you talk about it as holy and beautiful as an, as an, and as a gift from God, they'll keep their door open. And they'll, they'll have honest conversations about you with about what's going on inside of them. I know this is something strange. And again, this is just something Mark and Dawn did. But actually, my mom and dad started this. Like, we don't close our bedroom doors at home. We don't. The only time our girls close the door is when they're changing. And it's so cool. I just, I, I'm not even sure why you do it. We never actually said keep your doors open or anything like that. But as soon as they're done changing their clothes, they open the door. Like my kids do not come home from school, go pop, 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 up to their room and shut the door for the next six hours. They do all their homework downstairs in the living room. They do all their conversing with their friends and everything right in front of us. I'm just so thankful. And honestly, I don't know how that happened, but I'm so glad it did. And my parents started that open door policy where we slept with our doors open. So the downside of that is we hear other people's alarms going off. But I would rather have that annoyance than wondering what's going on behind a closed door for hours. I love the openness of my family and I encourage it highly in yours. Teach early that our bodies are holy. Okay, this is something really important, specifically for ladies. So moms and dads of ladies or ladies in the room. What's given away cheaply will not be seen as a prize. 
Many times, ladies think that the only thing they have to offer a man to keep them is their body. That's one of the greatest lies of the female adolescence. If I give a man my body, I'm going to keep him. I'm going to tell you, that does the exact opposite inside of a man. Because once a man feels like he's conquered her, he doesn't really have a use for her anymore. That might sound really harsh, but I want to tell you, young men who are not raised in intentional environments like we're describing will see women as conquests instead of prizes to be earned. I can't tell you how many young men, even when I was growing up, they would talk about you know, how they were able to get a girl all the way and that kind of stuff, and it's still that way today. And somewhere along the line, women believe that the way to have a man is to give their body away, and once they give their body away, they're going to have him, and of course he's going to love me forever. And it's quite the opposite. Your body is a prize to be earned on a wedding day. With all the love in my heart, I want to say this. So, Parents of young people, specifically adolescents, teach them to prize another woman or another man. Teach them the value of who they are and their body and why it should be waiting. I, look, I even, I remember when I got engaged, um, a mentor, a spiritual mentor of mine who was on a college campus, he, he shook my hand, he says, congratulations. Now you have all the responsibilities and none of the privileges. And I thought that was an awesome statement. And so, you know, I, I know a lot of dating relationships always wrestle around with the idea of, like, where's the line physically? Anybody that's already married, have you ever struggled with that? And, or dating relationships, okay, all, that, okay, for the, all of you, you all think about this. This is something he told me that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. So if you're with someone you're dating, girl or boy, and they're not your spouse, he says, do whatever you would do with them that you would want the person that's with your future spouse to do with them. Oh, as soon as I heard that, I backed up five feet from every single girl in my life because I don't want anybody touching my future wife. Do you understand what I said? I love that principle. I want to care for this person like they're somebody else's future spouse. And until I've won their heart, they're not my future spouse. Until I've given them the openness and the fullness of my heart, how dare I touch something that's not mine yet. Amen? You start thinking that way, you'll start to prize people the way the Lord does. How are we doing? Okay. I got a couple more here. I know it's noon, but I think this is good stuff, so listen up. Number six, don't buy everything for your kids. They don't need nearly as much as they or you think they do. Hello? Yeah. Working at a young age is not bad. I, I actually believe this. Now, I'm not making my kids slave drivers at all, but as soon as they were able to, they started working. And today, I have four conscientious, hardworking, anyone would want to employ four children. Because they are diligent. When you're not there, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Probably better or at least as good as you would do it. Because they learned at a young age that they're not entitled to anything. We didn't give allowances to our children. Does that make me a bad parent? I wanted to teach my children early on that if you give him, you're given money, it's because of something that was either done or invested for a return. If our children at a young age are just constantly given money every week or all the time, they'll start to get this mindset that money just shows up because I'm awake and I'm cute or it's my birthday, you know, or whatever. And I'm not saying some of that stuff's not bad. Give a gift to your kids. Grandparents, give gifts to your grandkids, especially mine, on their birthdays and at Christmas time. <laughs> Rodney, hear me? Okay. But if throughout the week they're getting money and they can't connect it to anything, they will grow up and have an entitlement mentality. 
And then when they come to Fuddruckers to work, they will not understand why they have to do things ongoing, consistently, every day to get a paycheck. They come in there. I, I can't tell you how many come in there and think they can just talk with the other people at work. Oh, yeah, it'll be fine. I, this is how it happens at home. Or I just come over here and I'll do a little bit and then I'll go back over and talk to my friends for a while. Or then I'll come over this. And then the manager comes out and tells me, can you believe this guy? Every single time he comes out here and gets on my case about me not doing my job. <laughs> Guys, please teach your children how to work before they go to work. It is not their boss's job to teach them how to work. Amen. It is our job to employ them to teach them how to work in our place of business. It is your job to give them what's needed on the inside of them to be good workers. One day they will be good owners. Otherwise, some boss will train them how to be a good slave or servant for all the days of their life. They're better than that. Start them young. So, if my children do the dishes, they don't get money. If my children vacuum the floor, they don't get money. Because someday, when they have their own house... And they wash the dishes and they turn around and there's no one to pay them. Except more dishes coming in. Oh gosh, isn't that horrible? When you think you're done with dishes and then you turn the other way. <laughs> Anyone else? Like I kept turning to the one side and it's getting lower and it's getting lower. Oh, I hate that. Huh? Do I want to know how? Okay. It's not a taboo subject. You can talk about it. <laughs> this is really important though. Teach early that money is given for work performed or money invested. Okay? It's really important now. Because like all of my children bought their own cars with cash. Their first cars. I think it's awesome. I think it should be done. If our children are given things like that, our children pay for their cell phones. I know some like 28, 30 year olds that are still on their parents' plan. <laughs> and my kids tell me about it. Guys, I'm sorry, that's just not the way we do it because someday I want my kids taking care well and stewarding well what they have. And it's amazing how you don't steward well what's just given to you. Amen? Here's something else. If you guys look up, I didn't tell you to look this up, Julia. Can you look up Acts 5 just really quick? I know I didn't tell you to look that one up. Can you dig up Acts chapter 5 and in verse 6 and then verse 10? Here's something that throughout the Old Testament, this is really funny. I actually think it's funny now that I'm 48 years old. I, I didn't like it when I was 16. But all throughout the Bible, you find out that the young men get all the really hard, bad, nobody else wants some jobs in the Bible. Here's one of them. Now, how many people know the story of Ananias and Sapphira? You know that they go in and they lie about what they were going to give, or they say one thing and then they give less, right? And then it says they die right there, bam, dead. And it says the young men had to go in and cover them up and drag out the dead bodies. Happened in verse 6, and it happened again in verse 10. There it is. They had to, the young men had to go in, cover them up, and carry them out, and they buried them. And then in verse 10, it says the same thing. You don't have to go there. And all throughout the Old Testament, I kept looking up all these verses. There was a myriad of them where the young men did all the worst jobs. Yes! Amen. Finally, it's your turn! <laughs> so... If your young adult children, boys and girls, are in their home with their fingernails clean, watching another show on Netflix, or playing another game on their whatever it is, unplug it and go make them pull weeds out of your mulch. I'm, or they can pull it here. I got a day for them. It's coming up. I mean this with everything that's in me. Something happens on the inside of a young person when they do dirty stuff, when they do hard things. Don't forget, the glory of young people is there. Don't waste it on a video game. We're losing our children in this stuff. They're, they're draining their strength. 
And we let it go because we think, oh, they're good kids. But they could be great kids. I want a generation of great kids. Amen? All right, last one. Talk to your children a lot. Talk to your children a lot. Be in regular communication. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them how their day was. And when they say, fine, okay, it was good. What'd you learn today? Nothing. Nothing. Are you kidding me? If after three weeks your children come home from school and say they learn nothing, you better be making phone calls to the teachers. Amen. And if you do that enough, they won't be telling you nothing anymore when you ask them how what they learned. They'll be telling you because they'll be like, if that teacher tells me one more time that my parent called them and asked them, just, be, just for an annoying, that's some of the fun stuff parents get to do. <laughs> but here what else. Our children are incredible, like incredible. There are worlds of worlds inside of our kids, especially our young adults. And all of that stuff that I was making fun of inside of Levi that was all stirring around inside of them, it's bringing up every single part of who they are. All of who they are at 14, 15, 16 is right at your fingertips. You just have to push the right button and you get it all. You get the anger, you get the upset, you get the offended, but you also get the love, you get the joy, you get the excitement. You get it all. And if you're a good parent, you'll embrace it all. You won't shut them down when they go off on you. Because if you don't, then you'll get them at their best. They have to have a place where they process all that's going on inside of them. And if you can be that place for the bad, I promise you you'll be the first place for the good. So be a, you have what it takes. You have the strength, the internal fortitude to be able to handle everything that's going on inside of them. And let them know, I'm that place. Otherwise, they'll go to friends. And those friends are having the same going on inside of them. And all they'll do is commiserate with each other and they'll play around in the mud like pigs. But us, who kind of have our stuff together, that stuff started to calm down. Remember, we, we struggle to have thoughts sometimes. We can bring solidity and strength and vision. We can give them perspective that's bigger than their current reality. What else I love about my children is the incredible insight that girl has right over there. I can, I, sometimes I sit down with Megan or Maddie or Lauren or even Anderson, and what they think, I'm just like, Holy moly. I never thought about that at their age. I am convinced that the generations can be better because of my four kids. I'm convinced of it because they're already thinking about things that me at almost 50 ain't thinking about. I'm so glad. Their relationship with the Lord, I've said this before and I'll keep saying it because I love to brag. It's like organic. For them, their relationship with the Lord's like breathing. You and I, come on, let's be honest. We kind of grew up in a lot of religion and a lot of legalism and a lot of stuff. If you read your Bible, if you go to church, if you do all these things, then you have a relationship with the Lord. And my kids are like, I just have him. I just think about him and he thinks about me. I just talk to him from inside and he talks to me. They don't go to church because they have to. They go to church because they love it. I told this story before too, and I'll tell it again because I love it. I remember back in 2010 when we were thinking about going to once a month services at who? We were seriously talking about it. We actually presented it to the core group and everything like that. On the way home from that meeting, Megan, in 2010, Megan would have been 13. On the way home from that meeting, Megan from the back seat of the car says, Dad, you better never do that. That's the worst idea I have ever heard you have. And she was like, she was mad. And I'm like, if, if anybody knows Megan, if anybody knew Megan when she was 13, I mean, you look at her face during worship and you would think she wanted to kill somebody. Like literally, if you looked at her the wrong way. So I'm thinking the whole time that if there's anyone that's excited about just once a month, it's Megan Derniak. But man, I misjudged her completely. This girl loves it. That's why every child's different. 
I realized something about her and the wisdom that came out of her in that moment, that day I shut the door on that idea. So glad we did. Amen? Listen to your children. They have an incredible capacity for understanding. Believe in them and watch the best in them come forth. Believe in your children and you will see what you believe in them come forth. They will manifest what we expect. I've seen this time and time again. If I expect you to misbehave, and so i got a bunch of rules around you, guess what they're going to do? But if I expect the best out of them, if I believe that they will act in how they were created, they usually do. Now, they have their off days, just like you and I do. But honestly, this is as honest as I can be with a group of people who I know love me. My children behave better than me. I mean that with all of the truth in my heart. I, sometimes my children have to correct me. In fact, now, as they're 22, 20, 18, and 14, I actually think it's starting to do this. Uh, am I wrong, Maddie? You're, actually, you're not wrong. I don't know. They're actually starting to point out things in mom and dad that they can be doing differently. And it's happening more than the other way. When did this happen? I love it though. I love it because my children are now at a higher standard than even we are. And it, it'll take place. If you're intentional about the culture we're describing here, they will flip it on us and they'll actually raise the standard. And then mom and dad get to a rise of their standard. And then their kids will come. And Do you see what goes on? I actually believe that's how the whole earth will find out the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. It's because our kids will shine more than us, and then their kids will shine more than us. Yeah. Our children are so wise, they're so prophetic, and they're so sensitive to the Lord. Don't try to teach them as if they're not. Create the atmosphere where that sensitivity and wisdom can come forth. Don't be so stuck on teaching them that they can't teach us. I have discovered that one of the greatest things I've ever done for my children is trust them. And the more I trust them, the more they long to be trustworthy. And doggone it, if they don't, most of the time, and when I say most, I'm saying 90% or more of the time. Dawn and I have created a context where we first say we trust you, not, ah, ah, oh, careful, don't do that, oh, oh. I'm going to do this just because I do it every time, and I love this story. Last story, I know it's late, but you guys are just enthralled, right? Like you're just so engaged, right? Good. So, no parent will ever understand trust until they teach their child to drive. Bob, am I right? And not only, I mean, this, this guy right here, you know, right, the shiny head right here, this guy, this guy not only trusts his own kids, but he trusts all of us kids too. He sits, how many, how many kids would you say you sat in the car while they've driven for the first time? How many different kids? 5,000? Okay, that's trust. Okay? Because you get in a car with someone who's never driven before. Hello? I mean this. And you get in a passenger seat and there's no steering wheel, Bob. Why, why don't they have cars like, they need more cars like this? With a steering wheel and a, don't even give me the gas. I don't want the gas. I just want the brake. I want the brake and a steering wheel and I want my hands and mouth on it. You know, ah. Nothing screams trust more than getting in the passenger seat of a car and having someone that's never driven before drive you. Oh. <laughs> now that would be a trust exercise. First, who would volunteer their car for Jason, first of all? Second of all, who's getting in? Now look, the only thing you have 
you're sitting in the passenger seat, and this newbie who's about, they got a whole lot of vim and vigor, right? They, they got some boldness going, oh, we can do this. We've watched you do this for 16 years, and I passed my permit test. <laughs> you know? Uh, the only thing you have is your relationship. That's the only thing you have. So for 16 years, if you've distrusted them, and you've told them how you expect the worst out of them. And you set up all of these rules. And if they don't do them, they get punished. What do you think they're going to be like holding that wheel? Terrified. They're going to be terrified. They're not, and then on top of that, they're going to make all kinds of mistakes because of the pressure they're feeling. And then now you're sitting there and you're trying to coach them where for the last 16 years, it's been rules-based, it has been expectation-based and all of that. I tell you what, it'll be a nightmare. But if you now, at 12, 13 years old, begin to create a context of trust, and I believe in you, and you have what it takes, when you sit in that passenger seat, and they're next to you, their hearts are more than wide open. Because there is some holy fear that should be there, okay? But that fear should all the more turn their hearts towards you. I need help. But if that fear, whenever it goes to them, if it ever turns to us, and we have been the, uh, uh, what's the word? like the perpetrator of what makes them afraid, the last place their heart's going to turn when they're afraid is us. So develop that trust now. Develop that relationship and that context of, I am yours. I did this. I remember the night I, con I, I conceived you. I remember the joy of finding out we were having you. I, this was the moment. Every moment that you have with your child is the reason why you had them. It doesn't matter if they're six months, six years, or 16. This is the moment. This is why you had them. Be in it with them all the way. Don't be a nag. Don't be an irritating nag, because it actually talks about no greater, like my man who frustrates his child, hello? There's a way to be with them and not be a jerk. Irritating and annoying. But it's the why. Remember your why in every moment. And they won't drive you away. They'll keep, you'll keep your heart open to them. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you so much for our children. Thank you for who they are, who you created them to be. Continue to give us eyes to see them the way you do. Holy Spirit, anoint every parent, every mentor, every teacher, youth leader, Anoint us with the heart that brought forth this person. Holy Spirit, we started out by honoring you today. And we end with honoring you today. You are the spirit that puts spirit and life inside of every one of our children. And your spirit searches the mind of God. Even the thoughts of God. We need your thoughts for our children. Teach us how to parent. No one knows better than you. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this privilege of being parents. In Jesus' name. Amen. I love you all. Have a great week.